Saganagadi, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'll now turn the uh, mic over to the warden for a second. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd just like to take a moment before we begin um, to recognize that today the global community learned that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II passed away at the age of 96. As a sign of respect, East Hance has lowered flags to half-mast at the Lloyd E. Matheson Center in recognition of her service. The flags will remain lowered until sunset on the day of her funeral. And I'd also like to take a moment to offer our sympathy to the people of Saskatchewan as they deal with the massacre and its aftermath, a situation that we here in Nova Scotia understand all too well. And because of these two solemn events, uh, before we start, I would just ask if we could have a brief moment of silence, please. Thank you. To you, Mr. Chair. All right. We're to be looking for an approval of or amendments to the agenda. Moved. I have a seconder. Seconded by Deputy Warden Mitchell. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. I'll be looking for approval of the minutes of July 19th, 2022. Moved by Deputy Warden. Seconded by Councillor Hibb. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, first in the agenda, the plan update background paper, Rural North, RU2 Zone, Debbie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, two background reports on rural uses were previously presented to PAC for their review. As per motion C21-341, a workshop with three rural councillors was held on December 7, 2021. Topics regarding the plan update and land use in the future planned area were discussed, and the results of those discussions have been included in the staff report. Planning staff are recommending that the majority of the future planned area be designated and zoned Rural Use North RU-2. So we have a map here, and there's a link to the digital map within the report. And this color here represents the Rural Use North RU-2 zone. So as you can see, it's the majority of the future planned area. And just in comparison, this lighter beige color, kind of looks white up there, but that lighter beige color is the, just the Rural Use Zone within the comprehensive planned area. A staff proposed that the following are permitted residential uses in the Rural Use North zone. So, uh, the housing options include single unit dwellings, two unit dwellings, mini homes, accessory dwelling units, and tiny homes on wheels. Mini homes, so under the current land use bylaw regulations, have three or more, having three or more mini homes on a property requires that the property designation and zone be changed to allow for a mini home community. Planning staff recommend that the same regulations apply to the RU-2 zone. Um, multiple unit dwellings. So discussion around multiple unit dwellings was had at the council workshop. There was a general consensus between councillors that the maximum number of dwelling units per lot should be 12 dwelling units with a maximum of two to three stories. Through the settlement background report, council approved the approach of allowing for eight units as of right and 24 units through a development agreement. In the current rural use zone, a property owner may apply for a maximum of eight dwelling units by development agreement. It is recommended to use the existing provision of the RU zone along with the increased development rights for multiple unit dwellings within the, set within the settlements to enable a variety of denser housing options within the future planned area. Locating the larger multiple unit developments within settlements will provide future residents with more local services and also help prevent land use conflicts with rural resource land uses. Recreational vehicles. So currently there is no definition for a recreational vehicle in the land use bylaw. Planning staff therefore recommend that a definition be added. So recreational vehicle means a motor vehicle or trailer which includes living quarters designed for short-term seasonal recreational use and accommodation and may include, but it's not limited to, park model trailers, class A, class B, and class C motorhome, a travel trailer, a fifth wheel recreational vehicle, a folding or pop-up tent or trailer, and a pickup truck camper. Um, 
So during the November PAC meeting, members indicated that they wanted to allow for more than two RVs on a single lot. Some future planned area residents um, through our uh, consultation process have expressed concerns regarding RV use and that was during the plan um, update open houses and as part of the plan update surveys. Um, in addition, commercial campground operators have also expressed their concerns over what they term pop-up campgrounds, basically groups of people who place their RVs on a property in a not-for-profit and informal manner. During the recent campground stakeholder meeting held on June 16th, um, the discussion about pop-up campgrounds was heated with many campground owners believing that council should be regulating these groups of RVs because they are causing the same issues that have been identified for formal campgrounds. And later on this month, we do have another report coming back to PAC regarding campgrounds and the campground uh, bylaw, P1300 campground bylaw. So in order to balance concerns and limit land use conflicts, staff recommends that the land use regulations should be put in place to regulate pop-up campgrounds. At the workshop, uh, rural councillors suggested allowing for three permanent RVs on a property and then allowing for eight more RVs rotating in and out of the property on a two-week basis. However, this would create the pop-up campground issue and would be difficult for staff to enforce. So therefore, it is recommended that a maximum of three RVs are permitted to be permanently located on a property and that a new special event provision is added to the land use bylaw to allow property owners to host multiple RVs on their land for a special event such as a wedding, concert, or family reunion. Um, resorts and hotels. So currently there is no ability to develop a resort style development in the rural use zone. Although there have not been many requests for the style of development, staff feel the ability to develop this form of tourism attraction should be available to both the RU and the RU-2 uh, landowners. The land use bylaw already has the definition for an accommodation general, so staff are proposing that this um, use is just added to both the RU and the RU dash zones, and uh, that they be permitted to have a maximum of 12 units to be developed as of right. And for developments over 12 units, has staff proposed that these larger tourist accommodations be considered by development agreement. Commercial uses. Under the RU zone for the comprehensive plan portion of the municipality, a variety of commercial uses are permitted as of right. Staff recommends that the same commercial uses that are permitted in the rural use zone also be permitted in the new rural use north RU-2 zone. So these include animal hospitals and veterinarian offices, couriers and, couriers and messengers, daycares, fabrication and repair, farm and forestry equipment, forestry uses and structures, funeral services, office of professional services, um, personal care services, repair and maintenance, restaurant, pool and limited service, retail and rental stores, trades, person and craft person business and offices, wind turbines and agricultural uses. In addition to standalone commercial uses, planning staff also recommends that the same regulations for home-based businesses be used in the RU-2 zone. Um, so the next item is the industrial use, noxious or obnoxious land uses. During the workshop that was held with rural councillors, a discussion was held regarding land uses that could be considered obnoxious and how those uses should be dealt with. The land use bylaw has two definitions to describe these sorts of land uses, both of which are considered by development agreement. And that's, as I said, industrial use, noxious and obnoxious. Um, it is recommended that development agreements are also required for industrial use uh, for for both of these uses in the rural use north zone. During the workshop with rural councillors, there was an agreement that these uses should be considered by development agreement and be determined whether appropriate or not by council. Some of the land uses include, but are not limited to, explosive storage, chemical treatment of lumber, vehicle racetracks and amusement parks, any industrial development engaged in the production, wholesale storage or distribution of dangerous goods and salvage yards. So, um, just as a summary of all the recommendations, all of the housing options currently permitted in the rural use RU zone should also be permitted in the rural use RU-2 zone. Allow by development agreement applications for small multiplex or dwellings up to a maximum eight dwelling units per lot, the same provision which is currently in place for the rural use RU zone. Implement the same regulations that are currently in place for the comprehensive plan portion of East Hans and require any proposed mini home communities apply for a planning application to change the land use designation and zone um, of the land to mini home designation and zone. Add a definition for a recreational vehicle to the land use bylaw. Allow up to a maximum of three recreational vehicles per property. Um, add a new provision to the land use bylaw to allow property owners to host multiple RVs on their land for a special event. Allow for all commercial uses currently permitted in the rural use zone to be permitted in the RU-2 zone. Permit only obnoxious and industrial 
use noxious land uses by development agreement in the rural use north RU-2 zone. Allow agricultural land uses to also take place in the RU-2 zone. Add general accommodation uses to both the rural use RU zone and the rural use north RU-2 zone provisions and permit a maximum of 12 accommodation general sleeping units as of right and permit additional units by development agreement. Um, campground uses are as per the council endorsed background paper on um, campgrounds. And so what are the differences between the two zones? So for RVs, um, in the rural use zone, RVs are only permitted temporarily on the same property that a landowner is constructing their home, while in the RU-2 zone, what we're proposing is to allow those three RVs to be permanently able to be located on a property. So industrial use noxious, um, the use is not permitted to be considered by a DA in the RU zone. It, it, it is, but what it is, it's you have to rezone the per property to industrial commercial first and then enter into the DA, so there's that extra step. Whereas for the rural use dash two zone, what you have to do is would be just go into the development agreement. Um, and council may want to consider at a later date requiring the land to be rezoned um, to industrial commercial, um, depending on how, what the, what the demand is for that type of use. Uh, new roads, so in the rural use zone, um, not permitted, um, requires rezoning to a country residential, lakeshore residential or RCD zone. And in the rural use north uh, zone, they would be permitted. Um, so the recommendation is that planning advisory committee recommends that council authorize staff to draft proposed amendments to the official community plan in regards to rural uses as presented to the executive committee um, today and outlined in the staff report. And the recommended motion is just below. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Warden Rolston. Thank you. Um, with regards, I'm going to start with um, the number of dwelling units uh, and the maximum number in what has been described as settlements is eight as of right and up to 24 through a development agreement. But in the rest of the rural use zone, you're saying none as of right and only eight by development agreement. And I really do not agree with that approach at all. Um, I've talked to residents in my area. I'm still, and I may move a motion to amend or do something, I'm still not in favor of these settlements. And no one I've talked to understands why we would do that. Because in their mind, in my particular community, they don't see any difference between Upper Rodden, Rodden Gold Mines, Center Rodden, South Rodden, West Gore, Gore, they're all little communities. And they don't see why one would be treated any differently than the other. And I tend to agree with that. And as far as folks wanting to uh, build multi-unit uh, developments, we need that in the rural area. And I, I, I think that they should be allowed everywhere in this zone, as of right, if someone has the land that can accommodate the sewer system and everything that's needed, I think they should be allowed as of right. The few that we do have are great little developments. The one in Kennecook, I have a few apartments in West Gore. There's never, to my knowledge, been any problem with them. And uh, so I have, I have a bit of a problem with that. Um, I'd actually like to see a maximum, you know, I can live with the eight. I'd have liked to have seen 10 or 12 as of right, period. And anything over that through a development agreement. And uh, you have to realize that in the rural areas here, we're not talking about cramming these buildings onto a half acre site or anything like that. Some of these properties that people will want to put them on, you know, will be 10, 20 acres of land. Uh, I look at the development in Kennecook, um, I don't know how many acres he's developed thus far there, but this would prevent development such as this. And uh, so I, I think it's too restrictive. Um, I, 
commend staff 100% for trying to strike a balance that we can live with. But if you remember when we had our very first initial discussions, council as a whole told staff that we, want, we knew we had to do this and we were willing to do it, but we wanted to do it with the least regulation and the least change possible for folks that would meet the requirements of the province. So my opinion on the multiplexes, uh, uh, I don't think there should be a difference between what you're calling settlements because I'm sorry, in the minds of the people I've talked to, your settlements aren't any different than anywhere else in the rural area. They, they just aren't. And uh, that's just how it is. And I don't necessarily want to send all the development to those particular settlements. I, I'd like to see the development spread out and keep the rural feel of the area. And uh, I, I like to not see one community develop a real density at the detriment of, of other places. And uh, so those, those are my concerns. So I don't know what other folks think, but uh, that would be my feeling that there should be the same, the same as of right and and the same development agreement everywhere, not, not just in certain small communities because we have a lot of certain communities that just didn't happen to get designated. And uh, those are my comments, thank you. Councillor Rhino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to staff, I, I'm going to echo uh, the warden's comments on those dwelling units. I feel those dwelling units' as aid is way too low. We need that development out there. A shining example of, is of what this warden talked about, is of Kennecook. That fits well in the community. Everybody's happy. Everybody's getting along. It's great for the community, and I'd like to see. So I would like at least 12 as a right and then up to 24 uh, for by development agreement if it ever comes to a, to a bigger development such as that. But, but like I say, those are the shining examples of, of what works in, in, in right there in Kennecook. Now I want to turn the attention to campgrounds. And a question to you is, you mentioned, or Debbie mentioned in the report that Campground Association was very heated and upset about these pop-up campgrounds. What do they envision as a pop-up campground? Um, through Mr. Chair, as I said, the report will be coming next, uh, next uh, in the next couple of weeks, I guess. Um, but basically, it's that informal, non-for-profit, informal campground setup where you have multiple RVs on a property, whether they're friends or family or acquaintances or however they're doing it. But they have um, multiple people on a property with RVs, and um, they said that they're also partying, that there's people who are also on site partying, and that they also have to deal with waste management or should be able, having to deal with waste management and uh, some of the same things that they have to deal with. So has there been a problem with that? Are you aware of any of these pop-up campgrounds causing a problem? Because I have probably two you could customize as, as, as a pop-up campground, and I haven't had, I haven't had a single report. Um, so you, Mr. I'm not quite sure about the development officer, but I did have one call this uh, summer about um, a pop-up campground, and I had forwarded the information from, that, from the reports and told her that a plan update was underway. But, so and I asked her if she wanted to submit a formal complaint or anything like that the council could look at, but uh, she didn't. She, uh, so, so then if it was a noise complaint, then it could be dealt with by the RCMP through our noise bylaw, correct? Um, and through you, Mr. Chair, I don't think it would be dealt with through the RCMP. It would be dealt with through our bylaw enforcement officer, wouldn't it? They would but take noise, along. but what I'm saying, is, uh, as an example, an excess of noise could be dealt with through the RCMP after hours by our noise bylaw. 
So I really, I really don't see a problem for there. It just seems like the campground association seems to, they're, I don't know, it, it, they want all, everybody to go camp at their campground so they'll pay fees. How fair is it to have own a piece of property and your family members can't put an RV on that and use it occasionally or out there? That's not fair. That's not, that's not right. What about the camp, the, the people that bring them out there and, and set them and use them as camps all year round? Can't have more than three there? I, I, I think it's just too, way too intrusive. And I think, you know, w you know we're bowing uh, for one reason or another to a little bit of ruckus that the campground association is bringing up over this. You know, I have, I say I have, you know, just a few kilometers up the road. I have three there right now. It's a family campground. They don't pay any any fees or nothing. It's just a family getting together. What is wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that in my mind. And up and on the Rock Road, I know there's two or three campers on, on uh, trailers on that. Same thing. A family getting together. And isn't that what we're supposed to be encouraging? Family get together in this now and this in this, in this era. Why would we knock that down and say, oh, no, you can hold, can't hold three on that or, or you're fined or, or whatever? Uh, I just think that's totally, totally unfair. Um, with RVs, um, what about uh, year-round uh, inhabitants? Or is that allowed in, a, in an RV? Um, to you, Mr. Chair, what it would be is once you get a permit for your RV, we wouldn't um, respond to how often you are at your RV, you just have a permit from the development officer to have a piece of RV on your property. And whether you're there during the winter or not, it, it we wouldn't be regulating it. You wouldn't be getting a permit saying that, it's not, saying that it's a habitable dwelling from the building inspectors because it doesn't come under the building code. But we wouldn't control when you were there or no, why you were there. Well, well, I guess what I'm getting at to try to clarify this is if we have people who, for one reason or another, that's all that they can afford to live in, is not is a trailer or whatever you call an RV, you know, how far do we, where do we draw the line? We know that they're living there year-round. How far do we draw the line? Where do we come in on that? Through you, Mr. Chair, the way that it was, it's intended, it's to be silent on the matter, so therefore, if it's silent on the matter, there's no enforcement of whether somebody's living there or not. So then, if we get a complaint, somebody, well, this guy's, this person, or this person is living in a, in an RV. How are we going to deal with it? We're not Year going round. to deal with it because there's no regulations indicating that the person cannot live in the RV. However, at the same time, we can't give them a permit saying that you can use it as a dwelling unit because it doesn't fall under the building code and doesn't meet the actual habitable dwelling unit. So, it's just we're, we have to be silent on it. Mm -hmm. You gotta be silent. I, sometimes I, I just shake my head on some things there. Um, trucking companies, where do we, where would that fit in this report? Uh, would that be one of the uh, things that would be allowed in the rural use north zone? Um, so, you, so we allow for forestry uh, type uses and stuff like that. Uh, what's the other stuff? Um, tradesperson, craftsperson. Uh, so it would just depend under what what uh, items, but um, we also have some new definitions coming under our, our omnibus um, presentation that will talk more about um, excavation companies and those equipment and whether what zones they go into. Um, so right now, trucking and warehousing I think would be done in the rural use zone by development agreement as a highway, commercial or industrial commercial use. Um, so item in. The idea is to use, do the same commercial uses as the rural use zone, so that would be the way that one would be done as well. So it would be allowed, but under uh, development limit agreement, yeah. Which could, which could be, uh, if if we don't agree to development agreement, they wouldn't put their company in, I guess. Those. So, I think this has a lot of times. This has a lot of potential to, you know, as as well as you, you know, is thought to protect. It can well inhibit business coming to, to the rural areas. And my last point, and I guess is I'm going to follow along with the warden on this one. Uh, you know, I thought that, you know, these uh, inhabitants or settlements or whatever you call them might be a good thing. 
The more and more I think about it, I think really it's too much. I think if we're forced on, this is being forced on us, if we go to a rural use, whatever it may be, I would say to blanket it, and then if we find down the road and under, under reviews that it's not working, we need more regulation, I think that was, and we all agree, I think that would be the time to enact it then. But, you know, you, you're dealing with residents out there who have no planning whatsoever. Now you're gonna put rural use in, then you're gonna put settlement things in, it, like the wards, it, it, it's confusing upon confusing, can come, being confusing. So why not simplify it by rural, rural, everything a rural use zone, and then if we see after a number of years under review that it's not working, then we could implement something else. Those, that, those are my thoughts. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have the, uh, rural, uh, the residential settlement uh, background paper here, and John can speak a little bit more to it uh, as well. But the, one of the reasons why we identified the residential settlement area is because those lots, especially around Maitland and um, that, they tend to be, I think Walton as well, they tend to be a little bit smaller. And so we wanted to restrict some of the uses, such as ex intensive livestock uses, which you could do in the rural use north, um, and not allow development agreements for items such as the race tracks and amusement parks and any of those obnoxious uses and not to allow dog daycares within those areas because as we know, they can cause issues as well. Also to limit uh, forestry uses within those settlements and um, some of the industrial commercial uses as well. And I'm not sure if the director wants to add anything else since he wrote the paper. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, th those were the reasons you might remember that we talked about um, this approach. And again, we, we did try to keep it fairly straightforward in that you would have, instead of multiple zones in the settlements, like you would in, you know, in more um, built up areas, there would just be one zone that would allow institutional uses, commercial uses, residential uses. It was really an attempt to basically provide all that you're allowed to do in the rural use zone but exclude some, of, as Debbie mentioned, some of those uses that could really cause conflicts when you have schools and uh, you know just a more built-up community uh, that you do in in uh, these areas. So that's where we came up with the whole idea of the settlement uh, zone. Um, I still think it's a good idea, and um, I again the uh, idea was that we understand none of these folks have had zoning before. That's why, again, the zone was very broad, it allows many, many uses, but does exclude some of those uses we think aren't maybe a good idea in those more built up areas. Uh, whereas in the rural use two zone, you know, I, I don't think there'd be an issue with the, some of those um, uses that you could consider. Uh, and it was earlier mentioned the, that um, allowing the multiple unit stuff as an example in Kennecook, and we agree that is a great example and I think the location is a great example too. It's, it's right in Kennecook, and under what's being proposed, that same type of development could be built in Kennecook, or Maitland, or Walton, or any of the other designated settlements. Um, and again, we think it's a preferable location for that kind of multi-unit housing because it is closer to some of the services there. Thank you. Uh, well, I guess to you, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from with with the answer you've given me. I totally don't. I, I don't agree with it all. Uh, you know what you're saying is for a group of let's say six to ten to twelve houses or a little bit more, you're going to treat them a little different than you are the person that's got two miles or three miles in between in between their residence, right? So you're striking a difference right there in my mind. And, and to me, I, I, like I said, it would be a lot easier if we start having these problems in these so-called what you do define as a settlement. I think then we could review it and then, okay, this isn't working. Uh, this is what we should go with. But uh, uh, to me, let's keep it very simple for the first few years so uh, everybody uh, kind of gets... Uh, Used to, used, to, used to this zoning uh, because really they're not going to hear much until they try to go to do something then then, then the phones of counselors in the rural areas are really going to ring off. So those are my feelings. Thank you.
Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So, for for the undersized lot, are you gonna like you need you need thirty seven hundred or one acre for rural use? So, if somebody have quarter an acre, what's gonna happen there? Um, to you, Mr. Chair. To you, Mr. Chair, any undersized lots, that's what we call them, you could still develop it for your residential use or whatever. It's an ex what we call it is an existing undersized lot, so it's still, you can still develop it. You won't be able to create another undersized lot, but you can't really do that now because, you, because of the septic system requirements, like you couldn't get a quarter of an acre or whatnot to build so, a house on. So there's not going to be another zone? Pardon like, me? It's not going to be another zone, just a rural use zone for everybody, like big yeah, lots, so small a, lots. So if it's, even if it's a smaller lot, what we're proposing in the RU-2 zone, you can still do those uses that are identified in the RU-2 zone. Um, and um, it's just considered an existing undersized lot, just like we have in the comprehensive planned area. We have existing undersized lots, um, especially around the lakes and Mount Uniac, but you can still build your house on there and your garage and stuff like that. Yeah, but but for for the uh, the excessive uses that you could use in the RU zone, I think we should go with a size two. Like I, I can't see somebody putting five horses on a quarter acre lot or a half acre lot. So if it's if it's already there, hundred percent agree. But if it's not there, like how are you gonna like? There should be, I, I think, I think we should be looking at the size of the lot too, because that's one, uh, I don't know if everybody see where I'm coming from, but if, you, if we don't put, uh, like the RU zone is very, very big zone. You could use it for almost everything. So, so let's say for excessive, like, uh, uh, farm use or whatever it's called. Why don't we put size, minimum size, you have to have like five acres or two acres. Like if you're existing, we're not gonna do anything to you. You're already there. But if you're not existing you in existing use, like the, it's not existing use, why don't we limit the size for the excessive stuff? This way we don't have to differ between RU2 and this way RU will be everywhere, but the size of the lot will intervene for the use that you want to use it for. Um, if it would be up to council, if they wanted to go that approach, we could look at that. That's, that's my, one of my suggestions. And uh, my other topic, which I think we are way behind the eight ball on it, is uh, multi-unit dwellings. I think limiting the multi-unit dwelling is not a good idea. Even 24, I don't think it's good enough for me because when, when you want to put a multi-unit, a senior home, you're going to have enough unit to make it a, a business for you. Like, you're not going to get a developer to put a 24-unit senior home and get the company to manage it. He's not going to be making any money. And I'm looking all over the place, like now in Hems Plain and Park Walk, where they don't have water or sewer, they're putting 80 units on sewer, on septic, and on well. And they have it for sale. and. A developer is going there. So why don't we open it? Why we're behind on that? We need, like I know in a rural area we need it, in Mount Uniac we need it. So I think we should open it up. We can't keep limiting ourselves to, to those stuff. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, just to, in reference to, I think, what's happening in, in the Hammonds Plains, those items are being done through either a plan amendments or through a development agreement. They're not just allowed as of right. And so I think they have to do hydrogeological studies in order exactly. to allow those the, that density uh, of people. So it, they're not as of right. They're through exactly. other I, processes. Exactly. I, I meant like going beyond the 24 with the development agreement. That's what I meant. I know it's, you have to do, you have to prove that site plan approval, that you have enough water, that you have enough sewer for it. But on eight and a half acres, they're putting 80 units or I know a friend of mine, he's selling one over there, like not a friend of mine, a customer of mine. He bought the land and he got approved for 80 units and it's on septic, on well, and he's selling it over there and the developer jump on it. So we need to 
open up for developer to move to our areas too. Like we are the growing municipalities, second or first, whatever we want to call it. But we got to open up our rural area too. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Looking at your report, um, there was no changes being made to the RU zone, correct? Um, there's that one change because uh, we have a reference to oh, um, resorts and hotels. Right now, the RU zone doesn't allow for resorts and hotels, so we just want to add it in there as one of those permitted okay. uses because I know tourism is one of the um, things that we're trying to promote in the municipality. So that change would affect all RU zones across that would, the municipality? Uh, yeah. Okay. That, that was yeah. my question, that, that any of these changes affect all RU because there's still large areas of the municipality that are zoned RU, yeah. Yeah. which is good. And I was, Councillor Musa took the words out of my mouth with a better example than I had, and, a, and it was, I understand the minimum as of right, but through development agreement, um, do we really need to put a cap on it? Because the development agreement would require, if somebody comes in and they want to put in and they have the land and they do all the background, um, it says here, up to 24, uh, why why would we cap it? Because their their development proposal and their and their research and their their requirements to to have everything done would would lit the the land and the and the resources are going to limit what size of development they can do. Um, that would be, and then it has to come to development agreement, which means it would come to council, local area councilors. There'd be public information meetings. Or it would go through the whole the whole system, and you'd really see if that development of that size was was suitable for that piece of property rather than just saying you can only go to 24 which as Councillor Musa highlighted might be deterring some people from doing some development because of the of the size limitation just something to think about um, moving moving forward I know for the rural area um, you know planning is going to be new it was new for a lot of other areas too and there's growing pains and there still is growing pains so I, I want to say the one thing I was happy to see was that we are taking the time to try and get this right rather than just pushing it through quickly. So um, I'm glad that the rural councillors got to meet in the caucus and, 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 and get some points forward because from the last report to this report, there has been a lot, I think a lot of movement and a lot of things that uh, make a lot of sense to me. Um, but I'm gonna defer to the rural councillors of the area that this affects more and, and listen to what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying not to get all over the place too much, but um, am I understanding correctly that what's being referred to as a pop-up campground, um, you're going to need a permit to put your trailer on there? Um, through uh, you, Mr. Chair, what's being proposed is that you could have three permanent RVs on your property um, and then anything over the three permanent RVs we'd uh, have a special event permit where if you wanted to bring in 50 RVs for a concert or something like that. I have a cottage on the shore. Mm -hmm. I have room out back. My son's gonna if he wants to set an RV up there do I need a permit to put it there? Um, permanently you, three you could have three RVs on that piece of property if you had room for them yes. With a permit or without a permit? With the permit. I don't want a permit. Um, that, that really... No, with a, we'd still apply for a development permit. No, and I, I don't agree with that at all. The other thing that you have to consider is also um, the sep ensuring the septic systems and um, you need a permit um, or some sort of information from the municipality to get power hookup and stuff like that. So it, it just helps to make sure that we know that if, if, you, if they're setting up as a permanent, that's your permanent cottage, then you actually have a facility to either dump your waste or your gray water if you're having somebody come in and pump your system or something like that, or if it's going into an outhouse, I, I don't know, whatever, um, don't know about the how they're set up, but it's just like a home if you, if it, or a cottage. If you're going to use it, you should have some sort of septic approval. No, I disagree with that completely, and I will not be voting in favor of that. Those small family areas that have two or three trailers, 
some that have won that I can think of. Um, the one in particular I'm thinking of, they use co composting toilet system there, and, and you know, it it all works fine. And if uh, in my particular cottage, if my son were to set up a, a camper trailer out back, the campers come with the big heavy cords that you plug into your outside outlet, and that's all the electricity they need. I mean, these pop-up things are where people are spending their weekends or, you know, things like that. You're not going to get people to apply for a permit to set a trailer up in the backyard. And I don't think you should have to. And you're going to be caught up in a situation where, is it permanent? Is it only here for a month? Okay, we'll set the trailer up in the backyard and I'll, you know, we'll haul it out of there in the winter time and haul it home. So it's not permanent. So I just think we're getting way, way too technical. I do agree with a limit before you have to get some kind of a permit because I had a situation in my area where a group of people bought a lot and set a number of trailers up there and caused all kinds of angst for all the neighbors and there was nothing we could do about it. And uh, so I do agree with some kind of a limit, but I don't agree with making people come in here and get a permit and making Making it impossible for someone who might be able to buy a second-hand RV and set it up on a lot somewhere and go for a few weekends of a summer, go through a process that would be so painful and so expensive that they wouldn't bother doing it. So I'm not in favor of that at all. Um, with And if I understood right, because I'm, I'm hearing things that I kind of missed when I read through this, but... So if um, John Doe owns a dump truck and a backhoe, has a garage behind his house, does a little, has a little excavating business, he's not going to be able to do that now if he doesn't have a development agreement? Through you, Mr. Home-based businesses are permitted, and I believe that that's permitted in there. And we're also proposing to have a new um, definition for an excavation and construction company that we're proposing to add to the ladies' bylaw, which isn't in the land use bylaw yet, and adding that to the RU and the RU-2 zone. When we're referring to development agreements, it's for those big trucking and warehouse companies that where you have multiple tractor trailers and stuff like that. If it's related to a forestry or agricultural use, then no, you wouldn't need the development agreement because it's accessory to those. But if it's like a standalone warehousing thing where you'd see in the business park, then and it comes under that definition, then yes. Well, I think we need to be very clear on that before we do anything because there are numerous people in the rural area who have a couple of dump trucks and a backhoe and an excavator. And uh, I'm not interested in making it any harder for those folks to make a living. There are no problems that I'm aware of occurring now. And I just see us trying to fix things that are not problematic and uh, and with the comments and I understand completely that this was new for the rest of the municipality at one time but the difference being where the zoning is in the rest of the municipality it was requested by the residents this has not been so anyway I I, I do not agree with uh, needing permits to set two or three RVs up on your lot. I, I do not, I think, I, I just don't. Um, with regards to limiting to 24, it, it becomes difficult because now it doesn't make any sense to limit a development to 24 units if you've got 100 acres. Um, what you would, I suppose, force the developer to do is subdivide his land instead of keeping it all together. So I don't know if there's, you know, something different that can be done there, but I I am with, with Keith, once again, that it shouldn't be different for these settlement areas. And 
With regards to the settlement areas, the community of Upper Rawdon is one of your proposed settlement areas, correct? And in the community of Upper Rawdon, we have a large salvage yard, we have an abattoir, we have a service station slash garage, we have a school, and we have a church. And I'm not aware in all the years that I've lived there of any conflict arising around most of these. Um, and any, any complaint I ever heard was not a municipally governed thing. It was an environmental thing, which it would still be. So to... Well, I'm, I'm still not in favor of it. Um, at all. The, um, the discussion around small lots and the limiting of livestock and such on it, I'm not interested in going there either. Um, I don't have a huge property, but my husband has always had animals and, you know, we run it, I think, very well, the animals that we have. To have limit yourself to an acre for a horse or something, well, that's not necessary. You can have a turnout and stalls in a barn and everything for, for that. And you can have a, a building there and house your cattle in the wintertime. And we have a neighboring farmer when we had a number of cattle and he, he always gets our manure pile every year we, we have that all looked after and we don't have any complaints from any neighbors and i know lots of places in the rural area that might only have a couple of acres but they have animals and usually they pasture most of them out somewhere for the summer but they may be there on the property for the winter so I, i'm not interested in trying to do that unless unless it becomes a problem down the road so those are, those are just a, a few things. Um, like I said, I, I don't know where we go. I guess we would start by moving amendments to uh, change things we disagree with. And I'd like to revisit the settlement question. I know we discussed it previously and then it kind of went through, but uh, as Councillor Rhino said, he's kind of rethought the whole thing, and I suspect maybe he's been talking to folks the same as I have, who, who really don't see the communities as any different. And uh, why should someone with land within, and, and where are you gonna set the boundaries, within the boundaries of one community? And yes, you can build 24 units there with the development agreement, but 500 feet down the road, across the boundary in the next little community, you can't do that even though you've got more land. And uh, we don't want to drive all our development towards those little communities. We, we, want, we want our whole area to develop and to prosper. And that's, um, that's my feeling anyway. So. I'll, I'll leave the discussion to others for now, but uh, I may be ma moving some motions a little later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff, a couple of questions, I guess. The uh, RU2 zone, the proposed three RVs permitted located on a property. Uh, does that mean that the homeowner has one and he can only have two more, or is that three in total? Three in total. Three in total. Um, I know of one location that has, it's a very large piece of property. The homeowner has an RV on it, it's, it's, not, it's away from a regular house, and he has three of his family members also have RVs there. So there's four on his property. So. If that situation arises in the R2 zone, one of them would have to go away. So I'm, I'm just proposing that maybe we should have the homeowner have one plus three. Just a suggestion anyway. Other people may think wrong. 
in the ordinary rural use zone, what is permitted there for RVs now? Is this that temporarily on the same property that the landowners constructed their home? That's it? That's correct. So um, we consider them, if, if somebody's constructing a home, you're allowed to put your RV up so that you're on site to mm. look after it and make sure that there's no issues. Mm. And I know, uh, well, in Shubenacadie, Harvard Lands, Nono River, um, West Indian River, there's a lot of rural use land there, which is the same as what the land we're talking about now. And uh, I would like to see that, that same proposal on that piece of property too, in the rural use zone there, because it's a land, it's not developed. I mean, it's 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 a country, you know, it's rural, and I could see it if you just handed a subdivision or something like that. But I think, you know, if we're going to do this to the R two zone, I think this should be put in the regular rural use zone also, because there are areas in this, as, as I mentioned, that that uh, big properties that would also allow that too. So, um, I would like to see that added on to the uh, rural use zone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, once again there, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to back up the boat here for a minute, uh, just so I want to clarify something. So if I had three campground, three three RVs in my campground, I wouldn't need a permit. Through you, Mr. Chair, the way it's proposed is if you're having, locating three permanent, like I'm not saying coming in for the weekend to visit your aunt or uncle or whatnot, but if you're locating your three permanent RVs where you're gonna have hookups to some sort of potable water resource or some sort of waste management system have power hooked up to your site, then that's, three is the maximum, yes. Without, without permit, with, with permits, as of right. With permits, so you come in, get your permit from the development officer and then you can have three RVs there That's not the way I under the way I understood it. And I guess I understood it wrong. That you could have three years of right, and anything over that requires a permit. Because I can tell you right now, there's people that are going to be upset if they got a, they're leaving their camper there for the year, only use it in the summertime or whatever, and they're going to be required to come in and get a permit. They're not going to do that. They're going to be up in arms. Now, I'd like to see. Uh, uh, if we could have six, but also I understand that we can have six, let's say, let's use my property. I wouldn't, my little piece of property there that I live on, I wouldn't want six campers, be allowed to have six campers on it. So could we tie it to acreage? Could we tie it to land size that we can require that if it's this big, yeah, you can have five, or if it's this big, you know, I guess something too similar what Councillor Hibb was saying, you know, he'd like to have that over there. But if you've got massive land and you're only allowed to have three, that doesn't make any sense. If you have a small piece of land and you're allowed to have three, that really doesn't make any sense any either. So could we create something that we can have these people that are having, using these, getting together as a family and, and, and having a great time, and it's all about family for me. Could we have something along that line that, you know, depending on the size of, of your lot, you know, we could scale in how many more uh, RVs we could we could use. Is, is that to me that sounds re pretty damn darn darn reasonable, and uh, and something we should be able to consider. But to, but like backing it up, I do not agree with. People have to come in and get a permit for for to put an RV on their lot and only there six months of the year or anything like that. I I, I just I, I think I think we're asking too way too much, going too far. Um, do you, Mr. Chair, if you wanted to put a ratio of, of uh, units per area of land, you could do that. RVs with it as of right. Um. Yeah. That's what I guess I be, be, would be leaning to. You know, I have a full consideration. Like I said, you're not going to put, I don't want three, three RVs my little piece of property. I don't think anybody should take advantage of that. But if you have the property to have those three, I think, you know, and, and it's used as a, as, a, as a family campground, no, not for profit, what is wrong with that? And there's not too darn many out there, really. It's, you know, two in my area that I know. 
Some may use them singles as, as camps or, or whatever, and, and I don't have a problem with that. But uh, I think we really got to revisit that one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just some comments. Um, I understand like what Councilor Hebb talked about in the RU zone, giving the same rights. However, we have to remember the RU zone already exists in a lot of areas and a lot of times it abuts up next to country residential, right? Uh, Lakeshore residential, R1 and R2 housing on the same property. The same PID can have half of the RU and half of it uh, in my area, Lakeshore residential. In the Lakeshore residential area, RVs are not permitted to put your RV next to the lake because there's also considerations for environment and everything else. So in this situation, you could have somebody just put four or five trailers, make the driveway longer, put four or five trailers right next to somebody's permanent home. And you're having your family come over and, and doing that right next to a permanent resident, right? Like, so when we look at what's happening in the RU zone, it affects the whole municipality not just the on-planned area. Um, so I personally would not be in favor of, of moving without some sort of, of criteria to limit those things to abut next to established country residential or Lakeshore residential or R1 or R2 housing um, RVs to be placed permanently. Um, the, the other thing when it comes to, I don't know whether it's a permit or whatever, but this summer, I was out ATVing with a friend of mine and we came through some trails and went down some roads, some properties, and there are RVs out there in the rural, the rural area. And some of them just have their poop pipe going right on the ground. It's not being contained anywhere. It's not going anywhere. And if there's a river, a lake, or any type of water course, what are we going to do to ensure that people are, are, are keeping their waste? I understand it's a pain to come in and get a permit or something, but as a municipality, I think we have to ensure that wherever these permanent RVs are, the waste management is being done correctly because we because the environment can't enforce it unless there's a permit. And, and that's just the way the system is. I have no problem. I totally agree with Council Rhino. If you want to do it by size or anything else, that's, that, that's fine with me. But the waste management of gray water and, and septic needs to be controlled in some way to ensure that where these are going, because this could be one property here puts up six, six, seven trailers, next property over is a farm, right? If they're not properly managing their, their sewer and septic, that can now affect livestock and the people living next door, depending upon where that goes in the water table, right? And by the time it gets reported, by the time investigations happen, it's too late. You've already spoiled a lot of the land, the soil gets in there. We need to make sure that we protect people as much as we give them rights. And, and when it comes to the, the hookups and the waste disposal, that is something that I think needs to be uh, tracked and outlined. And it should be a one-time, if it is a permit, it should be a one-time thing. I'm putting three permanently on there, just like your building permit. You only get a building permit once to build your home. And it should be minimal cost and just one inspection or, or whatever it could be, but there needs to be something to control the waste and gray water on these sites because of the environmental impacts it could have being next to a river or any water course. That's all I gotta say, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question, Debbie. Uh, in, in the area zone uh, provisions, are you two zone provisions? You said, therefore, staff propose adding an accommodation, generally use up to a maximum of 12 units to be developed as of right. What that mean? Um, so that's the, under the, three, Mr. Chair, sorry. Um, that's the resorts and accommodation. So if you wanted to build, I, cottages? Like cottages or like a little hotel or something like that, an inn, then you can have 12 rooms in that inn. And then, um, if you want to do over 12 and do like a large resort that you, like Fox uh, Harbor down there, then you'd have to go through a development agreement process. So it's to try to add uh, the ability for those landowners that want to do like an inn or small motel or something, especially along the Bay of Fundy, 
up along the parks or, or whatnot, an option to do some yeah, the, general it, accommodation. Just an RU2 zone? Not, RU-2 and the RU zone, so adding it to RU both. Zone. So, so, so what's the difference between having 12 cottages as of right, and if I want to do 12 senior homes, we need more than cottages, I have to go through a development agreement. Um, so you, Mr. Chair, the thinking is there is that in general, when you're looking at a, a, a room in a inn or a hotel, they're usually only about 300 square feet. Small cottages uh, are usually only a, a few hundred square feet. So the size of a home is usually a much larger, like 800 square feet for an apartment unit or, or such. So it's just basically the, the size of the units and the fact that um, the accommodations are occupied all year long, whereas many tourist accommodations shut down during the winter time. So, so can can you explain? I, I know I know exactly the reason why, but I want to hear it. Why should we need an, um, a development agreement to go up to a twelve unit if we can have site plan approval and identify that we have enough of sewer, enough water, enough stuff, just to invite the neighbors and whatever whoever live on a road from. Here to Shibanakadi to say, oh, we cannot more afford more cars on the road and stuff, and put it behind six, eight months to be able to do something. I, I, I like to see something as of right in the rural area that is by site plan approval. I think, I think, I, I think site plan approval will 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 be much, all, all we need, like, to, to approve something like that. So we don't have to drag, every time somebody want to put the eighth unit, you have to go through a public hearing and drag the half the community. And I don't know, I'm, I'm having a hard time. I don't know about other councilors. They want to keep control of that or they want to get something to be done without, up to a certain limit without any development agreement. Thank you. Going to move a change for the RU-2, the Rural Use North Zone. I'm going to throw this out there. And I am going to move that there be allowed 12 units as of right and 24 units through a development agreement. understanding that that might still limit in some ways that we wouldn't, but I guess I believe it would provide the protection we're looking for, and then if someone were not, we don't have people knocking down the doors in a rural area to build more than 24 units on a lot, and if someone had a large enough lot that would accommodate that, they could certainly apply to have it rezoned to something that would permit more than 24 units. Uh, am I correct? Sorry, I was writing, John. Um, if someone wanted to put more than 24 unit development on a property, they could apply to have it rezoned to a zone that would allow that. Um, through the R3 zone, if, if uh, through the proposed updates, I suppose you could rezone it and redesignate it to the R3 zone and then enter into a development agreement which would allow you, um, I think it's uh, a certain number of dwelling units per area of land, so that would give you an ability to do more than 24 dwelling units. Or alternatively, they could subdivide their land. Alternatively, they could do that as well. So there, it, you know, for the time being, I would be satisfied with this. And if developers started knocking down our door in the rural area to build larger developments, we could certainly look at amending it at that time. But for now, I am, I am moving that in the um, RU-2 zone, you be allowed 12 units as of right and 24 units through a development agreement. Move we have a seconder? Second. Second by Councillor Rhino. Discussion on the motion. Councillor Musa. As of now, we, do we have R3 zone in our area, in the rural area? Um, so you, Mr. Chair, I think we could apply the R3 zone to the, can we apply the R3 zone to the rural area, like if, where there's no services? Yes. I, um, 
Sorry, Mr. Chair, if you just bear with me a minute, I just have to look at the... It's a, not a question we get asked very often. There's not a motion on the floor. I'm moving to amend the document before a motion. Okay, so we would have to make an amendment in order to allow the R3 zone in um, the rural areas. You just have to make a text amendment to Landy's bylaw to say that um, it doesn't have to be serviced by sewer and water because right now our documents say that it indicates that it has to be serviced by sewer and water for a large multiplex. Okay, one, one more question. So, if you if you if you rezone, if you apply to rezone for R three, then you can't put road in. If you, because if you don't have enough frontage for R U zone, you cannot subdivide it to do more than twenty four. You have to have the frontage, and you cannot build a new road in R U zone. So you're stuck to the twenty four, even if you have a hundred acre. Um, so you, Mr. Chair, so. In the RU zone, that's correct. You'd have to rezone it to a different uh, item. But in the RU-2 zone, zone. Um, we're not putting in that same regulation because we don't have the same development pressure um, that the, some of the other areas have. Um, so I guess we'd, if whoever the developer was that wanted to build an apartment building would have to come in and ask for a text amendment to the land use bylaw asking for... Uh, our three zone uses for a large multiplex be considered um, without being serviced, and then they could put in a can you put in a road on our R three. I don't know. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I can't answer these questions off the top of my head because they're just too complicated. That's okay. Take your time. So, okay, let let me get it. Uh, Okay. There you go. It's on now. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in generally in the R3 zone, no, you can't build new roads, but there is an area, remember we went through a big discussion about creating an area where you could uh, in the rural north, and then there is a sliver of zoned area in the R3 where you can create new roads. That's correct. Sorry. I forget what we call it, the something restricted road area or yes. something. Yes. Uh, the Rural Subdivisions Development Area. That's it. So, so, so. <clears throat> so for clarification on the motion, the, the motion is only for the RU2 zone or the RU and RU2? RU2. So just in the RU, you're going to allow, RU2, you're going to allow up to 12 units without development agreement. That's the motion that's coming from the warden, I believe, yes. Uh, I'm not going to go with it because I think I think the RU should be able to do the same thing. So, thank you. Uh, there's nothing to prevent an amendment at some time to the RU zone. Um, my intent here tonight is just to try and hammer out what we want in the RU2 zone before amending things in the zones as they currently exist. We are in a kind of a mini plan review. Um, so, you know, I, I haven't put any thought into the rural use as such. And I understood the main focus of this meeting was to get the zoning locked down for what's currently the unplanned area. And that discussion on reviewing the other zones would follow in due course. Is that correct? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, other than some omnibus uh, kind of amendments to the documents, we weren't proposing to do any substantial amendments to the RU zone. Okay. Seeing no one else, am I looking for a question on the motion? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. It's just a motion. There's no motion on the floor. This is not an amendment, it's just a motion. This is a motion to amend the document that's been presented with it to us. 
to allow 12 units as of right and 24 units through development agreement in the RU-2 zone. Missing somebody. And the motion is passed, 12 to 1. Councilor Musa voting nay. Right Chair, through you, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you, your staff. Uh, as grandfather, if this document passed right now, are we saying any existing businesses that are, that are there now are grandfather? Would that be correct? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, what we would consider them are lawfully existing uses because they were lawfully existing at the time the document. Okay, so what about those three or four camp RVs that are on? That are on? Are They're lawfully grand... existing uses. That, pardon me? They're lawfully existing uses. If, they're camp if the RVs are already there, then hmm. they're already there. Well, uh, to me, I would like more staff to go back and have another gander at this again. Uh, this is me personally. Uh, I think we should go back. We should tie this to uh, land size on the amount of RVs that are allowed. And, uh, you know, I, I do not feel that coming in for a development permit each time is, is relevant. But that could be open for discussion in, in, the, in another report. Yeah. So uh, uh, I would like to move that uh, staff go back and, and reconsider. Uh, look at this again with regard and have it tied to lot size on the, on the number of RVs on a lot. Thank you. Just looking for a little clarification. I'm not quite sure I understand it. So we're still going to have a maximum number of RVs, be it three, be it four, be whatever. It whatever. But it's not going to be an open season that you can have. If you have an acre of land, you can have one or two, or maybe two. If you have five acres, you, there will still be a maximum. And I think, I think we should give staff that maximum number, because I think it was us that gave them the three, quite honestly, in previous discussions. I didn't hear that. I say it was us that told staff we wanted it changed from two to three in mm -hmm. previous discussions. So if we want something more than three, I think before we send them off to do a report, they need to know that. I still, you know, if I may, uh, I, I think that, I think it should be, you know, as many as six if the if the lots and land is is there to do it. I really do. Like I said before, I can't see putting six in my little property down there. But there are properties out there that have that have a vast amount of property that could have six on it, and not a problem. So I'm thinking it should be tied. Have a I'm not think have a discussion around. The, what it, how it would look if we tie, tied it to lots, lot size. You know, we could have three or one, depending on your lot size, and then and move up to a maximum, let's say six. Do you agree to that segment? Yes. Thank you, Warden. I'm not sure I can go with six. I just remember the problems in my area. And uh, I'm happy to look at a report, but I'm still a little hung up on having to have a permit to set a trailer up for my son in the backyard of my cottage to spend weekends in. And I know we've had discussion about sewer and things like that, but there are those, uh, I don't know what they're called, they're little portable tanks and you pump it into it, and then you take it to the campground dump site, and you empty it, and 
then you bring it back. Because in, in cases like I'm thinking about, um, they're not going to be using those systems all that much in the travel trailer. If the kids get up at night and need to use the bathroom or something, if they want to shower, they're going to come to the cottage and shower in the bathroom. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't have a problem with the motion to have a report. I, I really am not comfortable with, with up to six because if you get, there's a certain, certain number you get to when it begins to look more like a campground than a family compound type thing. And I don't think most families would, would have six set up permanently. That would be more like they might have two or three permanently and then two or three more would come in for the weekend or something for a family reunion. I don't know. Um, I guess I would just ask if staff would be comfortable bringing a report such as the motion asks for with perhaps I don't know how large a lot would perhaps be needed to have more than three. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. I mean, we can certainly bring that back. It would be good to have some direction on like what is the upper limit before we start calling it a campground, though. But yeah, I mean, even if you have a 50-acre property, you know, if you have 20 or 10, I don't know what the number is, but it just starts to feel like a campground after a certain number. Yeah. And you run the risk of someone doing that on a larger property and setting their six RVs out and renting them out to folks every weekend. And so I'd rather see the number kept smaller than six, personally. Um, I'm prepared to support the motion, but I think if we pass the motion, we should probably have a motion around an upper limit so that staff have the direction they need. Thank you. Huh. <laughs> well, geez. I hear what the warden's saying, but the warden kind of forced the issue when she said put a put a limit on it. So I had to throw a number up there. You know, I, I would be happy for staff to come back and say, look, this is reasonable. This is four, five, or whatever on a two hundred acre lot. Like, you know, I, I, that's why I was trying to get at this, right? And, and I assume that in this new study, or new, what, this new study, that we would, that we would revisit that, you know, as the warden has said, somebody putting a uh, RV in the backyard there and we need a developer, needing a permit for it. I really, I think that should be revisited too. But you could, staff could come in and they could say, well, if you got a 50-acre lot, we'd allow eh, four. You know, okay, let, let's talk about that. You have a 200 or 400-acre lot, yeah, we go to the maximum six. So to be fair, you you know, I had to throw a number out there because I, I guess I was pressed on it, so I threw six out there. <coughs> um. Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I just would like some clarification as well, because it might be fine and dandy to have like a 50-acre lot and allow six RVs, but then if you have neighbors right beside and they decide to locate their RVs right beside a neighbor, like, do, do you want buffers included in that, or? Well, I want the staff report. Yeah. You know. So considerations what we should we could be else should be considered this so, is what i'd like to see in it so the staff perspective is that pop up these formal pop up campgrounds over three dwelling units should be regulated in the same type of manner as a campground should be regulated is basically how it is because as councillor mitchell had indi uh, councillor perry had indicated sorry that you do have to take into consideration um, your septic system and stuff like that and i know you can have the cassettes, but you also have to take into consideration gray water and where these locations are, the RVs are located and they're lo usually located in very picturesque areas beside water courses. And so the only way that staff can be triggered to make sure that 
that these RVs are in compliance with Nova Scotia environment is if we know that they're there and we ask that the um, that they get a permit so that way we can check to make sure that they do have some sort of system and that could be maybe a compostable toilet system on site I, I'm not quite sure but they'd have to also find a way to dispose of their gray water um, so it's a way that we can trigger I mean and then if somebody does put in the the more than three units or, or whatnot on a site, as our building inspectors go, they can notify staff too, and then we can do education and get them into compliance. Anyways. No, but I guess my definition of a campground is, is a business. And a campground that charges for rental fees, that is a campground to me. People coming on somebody's land and just getting together, to me, that's not a campground. That's a, that's family getting together. So I just wanted to clarify that. Now, the issue is that when you get four, or five, or six campers on a lot, and they have karaoke with microphones every weekend, late into the evening, and there are neighbors around them that don't particularly enjoy karaoke, often drunken karaoke that's not very good, every single weekend night, it causes problems. So I'm inclined, the more I think about it, to stick with the three as of right, allow, have staff come back with a report. I'd prefer to allow more than three. They'd have to have a development agreement and provide the information around what they're going to do with their sewage, gray water, or whatever. But for the as of right ones, I just I think they should just be as of right. That's just what I think. So I'm not sure how I'm going to go on the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just some some question around the the zone itself. Like uh, I, I know from previous conversations about the settlements and non-settlements, the 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 problem that the council of the rural area have is on one side of the road you're allowed to do this, and on the other side of the road you're allowed to do that. So now we get around that, but we're creating. A big. Yeah, it, it gonna do something with the campers, but so 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 now we are creating on between the districts. So on one side could be two lots side by side, but one in, in district ha uh, in council half district and one in council uh, the warden district, and they can do this here and they cannot do this here. So I just mentioned that. Because we had that problem, and most of the councillors, they don't want one side of the road to have to be able to do something, and the other side. But now we, are, we have the whole district, one side on, on the edge of the district. One side, because you're in District 10, you can do something, and you're in District 9, you cannot do it. So I just want to mention that before we go to the vote. So I don't know if, if down the road we're going to be able to do something about it, or should be just, just mentioning that. I'm not. Uh, Complaining about anything. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is not to the vote, it's more to the topic. <clears throat> I'll wait. That's what I hate.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff, I realize these meetings is for the the RU2 zone, um, but in just in a late discussion that uh, we're doing a planning review and, and actually this Royal U zone wasn't going to come up. Am I clear in that? Um, through, through you, Mr. It's a, it's just a plan update with the fact that we have to meet the minimum planning requirements, which means that we have to zone the whole municipality. So that's why we're concentrating on the future planned area because provincial regulations have stipulated that the whole municipality has to be zoned. The rest of it is really just to try to fix some issues that have come up since 2016. Um, there's a few, there's some definitions that have been missed that would affect the rural use zone. Um, and uh, there was something else there today I was looking at, but I can't remember some clarity and wording. There's some accessory dwelling issues for clarity of wording that we need to, uh, to fix and to allow, for example, garage suites in the front yard in the rural use zone or where there's no municipal services, those types of ideas. And that'll be coming forward in a, in a report. I was hoping, anticipating to bring it back later this month, but that might be pushed depending on tonight. So we are going to get a chance to speak on the rural use side of things for the planning you review. Mr. Chair, it won't be a report on the rural use zone. It's, it's just an omnibus report that talks about a whole bunch of different zones. Well, I, 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 I think this is very important to me, and, and Councillor Musa touched on it there, between zones, between the, you know, on one side of the road, you're going to be allowed to have three RVs in your property, but if you live on the other side of the road, you're not going to be able because it's the edge of the zone. And that's why I'd like to see the whole rural use zone with the same uh, exceptions as the AR2 zone. Because, and I know you, it doesn't matter what zone or what we do, you're never going to please everybody. But it seems to me the people that's in the RU zone, who in the rural area, are being uh, stopped from having RVs on their property, but because of the R2 zone, the new zone, you're going to be able to have RVs on the property. So, and like I said, from Shubenacadie, you know, down to Maitland Way, um, Upper Nanmal River, West Union Road, Harvard Lands, there's big areas of land there that would allow, you know, three RVs on their property. But because of this, because of the rural use zone, they're not allowed. And I think if we're going to do the, the, the uh, RU2 zone with this, I think we should include the RU zone with it too. That's just my opinion. I know it'd be complicated, like, like uh, Councillor Perry mentioned, there's, there's places in his area too, but you can't accommodate everybody. So I think we do what we can do the best to, to accommodate the majority of people in the municipality. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a, a couple of questions that are coming to my mind as I'm, as I'm hearing this discussion. When you refer to permanent um, residents of these RVs, what about for people who come in in May and leave in <laughs> September or October? Uh, that kind of thing, if that's considered permanent or if they're storing them somewhere. And maybe this is something that needs to be looked at, the term permanent. Um, so through you, Mr. Chair, that somebody that came in for the season, we would consider those a permanent. That would be the intention. Uh, somebody that comes in for a weekend to their grandmother's property a few times a year, we wouldn't consider that permanent. But right. anybody that's there and they set up their, usually they have decking around and uh shed and something to mow the lawn with that type of idea and then they usually they could store them during the winter so that the um, mice and stuff don't get into them right um and uh something else that i'm thinking of and and i know it sounds kind of over the top to ask these people to um to apply for a permit i i do under part of me agrees with that when i'm thinking of you know uh, the resident having an RV plus a couple of kids having their RVs as well. When we when I start to visualize, you know, a half a dozen RVs, then I am thinking about the wastewater and, you know, all of a sudden that, that is playing a bigger role when I'm imagining as the numbers are getting a little higher, you know, that maybe a, it does seem like there, it, it's a little more official and that there should be a permit. So I'm just, I'm really um, going back and forth depending on what numbers we do finally come up with in, in, in uh, the next phase of this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 
there's, there is concern around the permitting act aspect of it. So before we make a final decision, we have another report coming back anyway. Um, could, would it be reasonable to ask staff to perhaps develop what they would consider an RV would need to meet a, permit, a permitting requirement? Like, is it just a, a cash grab? They just come into the municipality and say, I want to set up a camper trailer? Do they have to draw a plot plan? Um, what, what do they have to provide to prove they're looking after sewage and gray water? Is, a, is one of the portable things to haul it away enough? Is a composting toilet enough? Um, if they could get permission, maybe they can get permission to pipe it into an on-site sewer. I, I, I don't know exactly what, how onerous are the requirements going to be? Could we? If I knew that, that would help okay. me. Um, so you, uh, Mr. Chair, basically would treat it the same as if you're going to build a, a cottage on a piece of property. So you have, um, you're showing us on the site, especially if it's a 100 acre site, where you're going to put it, um, and then having some sort of approval. And it doesn't have like it be a septic system. There's plenty of cottages out there that use the composting toilets or that use uh, vaulted toilets and stuff like that. So some what sort of system. What about an outhouse? Yeah, that's, that's the vaulted uh, okay. toilets, so that it could use an outhouse. And, um, and then some way to manage your, your wastewater, like your gray water. And I'm, I'm not technical. What's that look like? I, I'm not sure. It would depend on, on what approval Nova Scotia environment, like what they well, want. I, I don't know if you can put waste I can't water. vote on this. If, I can't if I don't know what you're going to require these folks who, you know, want to set. And then you're so, into the whole thing where people already have an RV set up. Like, you know, if my son puts an RV in back of my cottage this summer, it's already there. And it's grandfathered, an RV there. How are you going to know what's grandfathered and what's not? Through you, Mr. Chair, there's, uh, Google has satellite images with a history of you, and we can go in there and take a look at when things were placed on a property. Oh, my. Um, so you, Mr. Chair, there's also the issue when you start allowing multiple RVs in a lot and that people use for a cottage all year long. Um, there's, through the taxes, and I know we're not looking at this at a tax grab, but through a, a cottage you get taxed with an RV on a property, there's no tax, land use taxes, so they don't tax well, RVs. I would just submit that in many areas there's a lot of tree cover and you're, all your Google satellite images in the world aren't going to show you anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm not interested in trying to pay money to hire Google to take shots of East Hans. The free. I, I just, I don't know, it's getting more and more complicated, so I guess before, I'm not going to make a motion to change anything tonight, Well, but I am going to make a motion that staff provide more detail on what they feel the requirements would be around a permit, if required, for an RV. In order to have a second. Second is by public member Balcom. Is there any discussion on the motion? Second. Questions been called. Is there a vote? Passed unanimously. Councillor Musa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just uh, to add on, like I didn't understand something about the RU zone. Where, where are we going to be able to visit the uh, to change the RU zone to, like, not um, in this plan review or through another you. six years or. To you, Mr. Chair, um, we hadn't planned on bringing a report forward on the RU zone because there was no substantial changes we were proposing to make to it because there's really, we haven't had very many issues. If council would like us to um, bring back something about the RU zone, I suggest that they make a motion for us to do so. Yeah. It, through you, Mr. Chair, maybe I can elaborate on that. So this um, originally, before the province required us to do bring planning everywhere, what we were doing 
was meant to be a five-year update of our current plan adopted in 2016. Um, and obviously the scope has gone way beyond that because of the requirement to bring planning to the northern half of the municipality. Usually in those five-year updates, I mean, the intent would be to, as Debbie sort of highlighted, fix errors and omissions or new things that have come up. Just, it's not meant to be a wholesale review of your plan. Um, and I would also say that the idea of allowing a number of years ago, council decided not to allow RVs on lots where we do have planning without a dwelling because issues came up with uh, waste disposal, uh, party sites, you know, the, all those kinds of things. So the regulation is pretty firm right now in the current planned area that unless you have a dwelling on a site, you cannot put an RV there unless it's a campground or unless you have a building permit to build a dwelling. Um, and I think, you know, we should probably be very cautious about changing that because so much of the current planned area does have a lot of other development in and around the RU zones that could cause uh, issues in the future. So if you want us to study it, we'll do that. But do, I, I would throw out a lot of caution with doing it. Uh, excuse me, John. I, I think uh, I, didn't, I wasn't uh, very specific. I wasn't talking about the RVs. I was talking oh. about the multi-units. And I've been after you for a while now to have a zone or to, to allow by right and especially in Mount Uniac we have a lot of demand and you know you know how much we're growing but we had we had last time I, I know deputy warden was there myself and Michael, my councilor Perry and most people asking what you gonna do for seniors like Debbie was there and everybody was asking we need something for seniors here and we have nothing so we, we need to do something because we are losing our seniors to the city. They are moving to the closest place near Mount Uniac. So, so if we don't put something in place for the, a developer to come and develop something for our seniors or for affordable homes, it's not going to come. For eight units, it's not going to come by development agreement. So uh, I, I think in this plan update, we should have a solution for this. So uh, you promised me something coming up. I don't know what's coming up, but I want to make sure, like before we go too far ahead with ourselves, that something is going to be done for for this topic and in, in the in this plan review. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so sort of beyond this review, I know there are other planning issues out there, and one of them is Mount a number of issues in the Mount Uniac area. So we're now starting to see a lot of developer interest in development in that area and there's some concern about the way that may you know over the long term the cumulative impact of all that and we've talked previously about the minimum lot size in that area and you know the impact that's having on the style of development and there are other things like multi-unit housing seniors housing so i think there is almost um i don't know if i'll call it a secondary planning strategy for mount uniac but i think there's Definitely a planning exercise that, you know, it's not on our work plan this year, but I, I think we do need to take a more detailed look at the UNIAC area. So, um, you know, it certainly hasn't been forgotten about, but I didn't feel it was, in, was within the scope of this plan review or plan update. Um, to you, Mr. Chair, just further to that, uh, in the draft documents, we've added it as a future project, and it's going to come forward in the omnibus report that we do a secondary planning strategy for the Mount UNIAC Lakelands area as a future project. So it's on our list of projects. And then it's just a matter of getting it scheduled and getting the funds to do so, whatever studies we need to do. So just a small question. As of now, if we move an amendment to allow eight or 12 units in our use zone by, as of right, could we do that in this uh, now, or it's gonna be? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, you could. Uh, again, like with RVs, I, I'd be a little bit more cautious about doing that. Um, uh, on the spur of the moment without thinking about all the impacts of adjoining land uses and how it might impact. Um, but, but to answer your question, yes, you could do that in this review. So I don't know how, how the other councilor feel, but I feel it's a good idea, so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've had my microphone on and off as we go through the conversation because I'm not. Um, there's a lot of issues being uh, thrown around. Um, I guess I would I would echo John's comments about the rural use zone and being cautious of what you do with it. Um, if there are problems that you're trying to solve, 
changing that RU zone may not be the way to go about doing that. It may be creating another zone or something. Um, that RU zone, especially in, uh, maybe not so much in Mount Uniac, but in this area around Elmsdale, you know, if you start to allow smaller developments, well, you're just going to get your urban sprawl just outside of those um, growth management areas. So um, that would cause some concern around servicing and, you know, you start to have sort of that Hammonds Plains effect, this, those lots and whatnot. Um, so I think if you wanted to solve a problem, doing it through that secondary planning strategy for Mount Uniac is a much better way to do it than, than tweaking your RU. Because when you look at the RU map, it's everywhere. It sort of, it, it touches all kinds of different properties and, and different areas. So I would caution against that. I'm not a planner, but I've talked to them enough about this type of development um, and look to see what kind of problem you're trying to solve and then go with a different approach from a planning perspective. Yeah, just a question, and I know that the settlement thing was already discussed and done. I know I voted against it, but I think I'm hearing a little bit of rethinking on some things around. And now the one change we've done tonight actually allows more as of right development in the RU2 zone than in the settlement, whatever it's going to be called. How, my, my goal is, an, I may win, I may lose, but aside from that, what is the most effective use of our time to look at that settlement thing again? Do we have to wait till the end and make motions to change it then? Or can we relook at it now? I'm, I'm just wondering, what's the best way to do that? So you, Mr. Chair, I, my next report talks about the overall zoning, so I don't know if you want to align it with that. Uh, Through you, Mr. Chair, and I, I would also say it would be better to give us direction now instead of waiting until you know yeah, we're closer yeah. to the end. So if you want to make a big change now or tweak it or what have you, then the direction now would be better than later. Well, I know my preference would be to treat those communities you listed as settlements the same as the rest of the rural area. As a councillor from the rural area with one of those settlements within the boundaries, the folks don't see any difference. They're not looking for anything different. That's my take on it. I don't know how other councillors feel about the settlements in their areas, but as Councillor Rhino said, I'd prefer to start with the basic zoning for everyone. And then whoever's here in four years, there'll be a full plan review. People will be accustomed a little bit to zoning and what it means. And then perhaps if we see that there's a need, then perhaps we suggest, you know, are there communities out there that we want to do something a little different and direct development or prevent this, that, or the other thing? Because I think as folks have said, there's not a lot of development pressure there now. Uh, there might be a little bit of people rushing out to get building permits and things on the books because they're afraid. They don't know what they're going to be able to do when this is done. So I, I just think we make it as easy as we can. And it's, it's not the end. As much as I might like it to be the end, it's not going to be the end. We only have to look at the rest of the municipality and how many times we change things and fix things and sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong, unfortunately. So we fix it or we try to fix it. And, and I think that's the point. Our goal here is to try to do what we have to do in the best way possible for the people that we're doing it for. So, I guess, um, I don't know what the motion should be, but in order to give staff some direction and shake your head at maybe you don't think this is the way to do it, I move that we hold off on separate zoning for the settlements at this time 
and zone those communities the same as the rest of the future planned areas. Motion is seconded. Second by Councilor Rhino. Discussion on the motion. Uh, Elvin, and your separate issue. Are you to the motion, Councilor Rosa? Yes. Looking for a question? Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion has passed. 11 to 2. Councilors Hibb and Perry voting nay. Back to you, Councilor Hibb. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't want to prolong this any longer than we have to, but getting back to the RV issue, and I've listened to Kim and I've listened to you, and, and I understand there are areas in the uh, rural use zone that we wouldn't may not want this, but there are areas in there that people are being restricted because of those areas. And I'm using examples of Nanaimo River, Harvard Land, anywhere. Right now, they couldn't have anybody come in on their property and set up a trailer for a few weeks for the summer because it's not allowed. But in the new RU zone, they are. And it just seemed to me, I don't know just how, if there's any way staff could, could rig up maybe a new zone or a new whatever, or new regulations for that. And it just seemed to me that the people, that it's in the royal part of the RU zone is being restricted for something that you know, they, they could certainly benefit from. And, and because of that, they're not allowed to have any kind of an RV in their property with somebody staying on it, so. Um, to you, Mr. Chair, so um, whenever you have a boundary, you always have people on one side or the other, and you know, that comes up all the time that you're allowed to do X or Y. And I mean, we actually have that now because the unzoned area, you can have as many RVs as you want on your property, and those people that are in the planned area can't. Um, so really, I guess we'd be kind of extending, you know, if anything, we're actually putting more restrictions on the folks in the current unplanned area where currently there are zero restrictions. So I guess it's getting a little bit closer to what's permitted in the RU. Um, having said that, I mean, if you wanna look at the RU area and try to identify areas where you think it would be more appropriate than others, we can get into that. But you know, as the, the CIO said, there's a lot of the municipality that's zoned RU, so a lot of- And, I, and I fully out. understand that, but I mean, we try and do the best we can for the people, the residents of East Hans, and you're not going to please everybody. And and I know, I know of two people that that are kind of upset, but they've done this for years. But they're not allowed to have their family and, you know, to set up for the summer on their property because it's it's not zoned that way. But here you are in the rural and the R2 zone. You're going to be allowed to do that, you know. And uh, it, it, to me, it's just not fair. It's not consistent across the, the municipality, and I know there are areas that, that, that are designated as RU that yes, you wouldn't want this, but uh, there are other areas that are. So I'll uh, just leave it there, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we go on any further, I just want to say, staff, I do appreciate what you do. You must be sitting there thinking, you know, all the time, what are these guys wanting now? They want it this time. You know, I really appreciate what you're doing. I may not agree with you all the time. It's a hard job you're doing. I understand that. All we're doing is trying to represent our, our residents and our districts to the best of our ability with going through these, these changes. So. I just don't want to want you to go away and, and, and think we don't appreciate you. We do, just don't agree with you sometimes. Okay. Yes, I just uh, echo Keith's comments as well. I, I wouldn't want your job for all the tea in China because, you know, you're trying to do a job and we're trying to zone an area that the majority of people don't want zoning, <laughs> and we don't want zoning, and we're trying to compromise. And uh, I don't envy you, and I likewise uh, appreciate that the effort you're putting into this to balance what you feel is best as planners and what we feel is best as politicians, <laughs> and it's not always easy. I just wonder, with the issues around the RVs, whatever comes of that, and uh, the rural use versus the RU-2 zone, at some point in time, I'm not suggesting it be now, but at some point in time, 
perhaps some of that area that borders the RU2 zone that's currently RU, if it's really rural, could it be as simple as looking at rezoning that to RU2? Now that we have two rural, we'll have two rural zones to choose from. And I know there'll still be somebody on one side of the border and one side of the other, but it might eliminate some of the issues in the really, really rural areas that, you know, just a suggestion that that might be something that we could look at down the road that, that might help with that. Because I do understand where folks are coming from. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff. Once this new zone is established, the R2 or RU2 zone, um, like with any rezoning, anybody could apply to have their property rezoned RU2, correct? Um, Go ahead, John. Through, through a rezoning Chair, application. It, it's a redesignation and rezoning, so it's a little yeah. more complicated than just a rezoning. But in theory, yes, you could ask for some portion of our U zone. I, I don't think staff would ever support if you were just picking one property in a large area of RU uh, to go to RU2. Um, and yeah. we haven't developed any specific policies at this point for changing from RU to RU2 or vice versa. Um, so you're just looking at the general policies in the NPS about changing designations, um, but in theory it could be done. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking like, especially for the case that Councillor Hebb was talking about, people bordering on or close, right? If, if they are really wanting this, then they have the opportunity, you know, ensuring they have the opportunity to possibly rezone. And by going through the rezoning and reclassification, then you let it lets people know if the neighbors are okay with it or not because you might want to be able to put six rvs but the person who just built a 300 five 800 one million dollar home next to you might want not want six rvs next to them and karaoke as the warden said playing all weekend right so it it's uh as long as we have the flexibility for residents to request change i think that's the the best way forward thank you Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just another suggestion. Can we do something like where the, the RU zone doesn't, uh, about like residential zone, like country residential or R1 or R2, you'll be able to allow to, to do that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, just for clarification, like you're wanting to put the like a uh, country residential zone up in the RU2 zone if somebody wanted to build a big subdivision or something like that. Is that what no, you're saying? No, no, no. If you have, if you have RU zone, next to a residential like uh, established residential r1 r2 or country residential or lake shore you're mm -hmm. not allowed to put the rv there but any other way you could i mean i suppose you could develop regulations like that i meant like the regulation for the ru zone like if you if you're about in like r1 or r2 or country residential or something like that you're not allowed to have a rv yeah. and if you're not you can this way most of my area, like South Uniac, everything in South Uni uh, uh, East Uniac, or Councillor Hab or Councillor Eisner, like all the rural area, they can, um, where, where they're not next to the RU zone. I'd also just like to mention that, like, there's some areas of oh, East, know, yeah. East in Enfield there yeah. and yeah. such that have some very lovely homes that are zoned rural use. Yeah, and, and they're I'm, on I'm a lake. Too. Pretty positive that. They would be very upset. Yeah. Garden I, I, I just one. got it there, so yeah. thank you. Yeah. It? Well, I was just going to say that, that the agenda presumes that we would be ready to move the, uh, the plan. And we would need to be able to do that in order to do the land use mapping part of it. But we've asked staff to come back with some different things which could result in changes. So I'm thinking that the motion that's attached to the report is probably not 
appropriate at this time. Um, to you, Mr. Chair, the, the motion might not be appropriate, but it'd be nice to get some feedback from PAC members just on the rest of the mapping. So with the consideration that we know that the motion was passed to revisit the residential subdivision zone, but there are some other zones that we just want to talk about. For example, there's one open space parcel in Mount Uniac that we were gonna add in there that we had uh, missed previously and uh, just some changes to the Fundy erosion overlay zone. So Thank you. It'd be nice to have feedback. I'll be honest, folks, I have no interest in staying here till 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. No, I don't. I think it's best to call another meeting for another evening, because if we're here to that late, decisions are not going to be made well. It is, I realize it's time consuming for council, but we all knew that when we ran for council. It is, and we want to do this right. We don't want to piecemeal it and throw suggestions out and off the cuff stuff, and that's what will happen if we prolong this any more this evening. I would say there's probably two more meetings of this length at least to get through this. At least with the questions and stuff that people want and had to have answered. So once again, I, I would suggest we look towards setting another meeting, which probably to me would be the Thursday night after executive. No? Why not? Or isn't that night saved for run over business? My email doesn't come to my phone, and I've missed it on the computer tonight then. Yeah. So that Thursday is not available, apparently, uh, due to staffing issues. I'd be up for suggestions, folks. On the 13th. You know, why don't we look? It, it, this isn't super time sensitive, is it, John? Like, I know you'd like to get it out of the way. I understand that. Yeah, we, we did have a number of events planned this fall, but I mean, the schedule always slides to the right with these things. So, yeah, But uh, like I said, we want to get this right. Yeah, We all want to get in the same page here on this and, and, and do it justice because we're it. We, we're the ones to have to answer to this. We just want it out there. So that would take us to the 29th of September. That'll give staff time to do some work. That night should be kept open anyway. <coughs> Am I right, Councillor Hibb? That Thursday night? Perhaps, perhaps not for public public members, would you be able to attend that night? Um, public member Stevens, were you? We just move things around. Okay, so our, can we have a motion for that? Moved uh, uh, Councillor Rhino, seconded by Deputy Warden Mitchell, that we uh, pick up on the plan update background paper and possibly the plan update future land use mapping on the 29th of September 7 at 7 p.m. Do you want to speak to that, John? Or Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So with that extra date, I get, what we would probably do is go back and look at what we were planning to bring to you at your regular PAC meeting this month. So we may move these some of these reports around. You may see some of this earlier if we can get it ready in time. But it's good to have that extra date because I think we are going to need it. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to have it all on a separate evening because this is what bogs the regular meetings down. The 15 minute allotments of time do not do this justice, and that turns into two hours, and then everything's behind. It is my preference would be to hold it all till that evening. It is my preference. Uh, I don't know about anyone else's. So, so, Mr. Chair, does that mean um, we were going to bring a number of other background reports forward at your regular PAC meeting? Do you want all of that held and do they, dealt do with they, in a separate uh, meeting? I would ask if they impact the discussion of tonight. Um, with our, our U2 zone. To you, Mr. Chair, the um, I don't know if we'd be taking the omnibus now or not, um, but there was... <laughs> 
couple of them that have to do, one of them has to do with parking in Shubenacadie and the other one that has to do with the Paca uh, watershed, watershed. watershed. I would but, think those would be all right to present, in my opinion. But anything that relates to this is going to get <clears throat> unmanageable at a regular okay. executive meeting. There's far too much discussion to be had to tie the executive meeting down with uh, with one topic. Okay. Yes. So we all can uh, have a question on the motion? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. This would be a vote, I think. Yeah. And the motion has passed unanimously. I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved, moved and seconded. All in favor? We stand adjourned.